episode 43. Those horse things. Luna appeared, holding Pigwidgeon's cage in her arms. The tiny owl was twittering excitedly as usual. There you are, she said. He's a sweet little owl, isn't he? Eh, yeah, he's all right, said Ron gruffly. Well, come on then, let's get in. What were you saying, Harry? I was saying, what are those horse things? Harry said as he, Ron and Luna made for the carriage in which Hermione and Ginny were already sitting. What horse things? The horse things pulling the carriages, said Harry impatiently. They were, after all, about three feet from the nearest one. It was watching them with empty white eyes. Ron, however, gave Harry a perplexed look. What are you talking about? I'm talking about... Look! Harry grabbed Ron's arm and wheeled him about so that he was face to face with the winged horse. Ron stared straight at it for a second, then looked back at Harry. What am I supposed to be looking at? At the... There, between the shafts, harnessed to the coach. It's, it's right there in front. But as Ron continued to look bemused, a strange thought occurred to Harry. Can't, can't you see them? Say what? Can't you see what's pulling the carriages? Ron looked seriously alarmed now. Are you feeling all right, Harry? I, yeah. Harry felt utterly bewildered. The horse was there in front of him, gleaming solidly in the dim light issuing from the station windows behind them, vapor rising from its nostrils in the chilly night air. Yet unless Ron was faking, and it was a very feeble joke if he was, Ron could not see it at all. Shall we get in then? said Ron uncertainly, looking at Harry as though worried about him. Yeah, said Harry, yeah, go on. It's all right, said a dreamy voice from beside Harry as Ron vanished into the coach's dark interior. You're not going mad or anything. I can see them too. Can you? said Harry desperately, turning to Luna. He could see the bat-winged horses reflected in her wide, silvery eyes. Oh, yes, said Luna. I've been able to see them ever since my first day here. They've always pulled the carriages. Don't worry, you're just as sane as I am. <sighs> Smiling faintly, she climbed into the musty interior of the carriage after Ron. Not altogether reassured, Harry followed her. Chapter 11 The Sorting Hat's New Song Harry did not want to tell the others that he and Luna were having the same hallucination, if that's what it was, so he said nothing about the horses as he sat down inside the carriage and slammed the door behind him. Nevertheless, he could not help watching the silhouettes of the horses moving beyond the window. Did everyone see that grovelly plant woman? asked Ginny. What's she doing back here? Hagrid can't have left, can he? I'd be quite glad if he has, said Luna. He isn't a very good teacher, is he? Yes, yes he, he is. is, said Harry, Ron, and Ginny angrily. Harry glared at Hermione. She <coughs> cleared her throat quickly and said, Oh, yes, he's very good. Well, we think he's a bit of a joke in Ravenclaw, said Luna, unfazed. Well, you got a rubbish sense of humor then. Ron snapped as the wheels below them creaked into motion. Luna did not seem perturbed by Ron's rudeness. On the contrary, she simply watched him for a while as though he were a mildly interesting television program. Rattling and swaying, the carriages moved in convoy up the road. When they passed between the tall stone pillars topped with winged boars on either side of the gates to the school grounds, Harry leaned forward to try and see whether there were any lights on in Hagrid's cabin by the Forbidden Forest. But 
The grounds were in complete darkness. Hogwarts Castle, however, loomed ever closer. A towering mass of turrets, jet black against the dark sky, here and there a window blazing fiery bright above them. The carriages jingled to a halt near the stone steps leading up to the oak front doors, and Harry got out of the carriage first. He turned again to look for lit windows down by the forest, but there was definitely no sign of life within Hagrid's cabin. Unwillingly, because he had half hoped they would have vanished, he turned his eyes instead upon the strange skeletal creatures standing quietly in the chill night air, their blank white eyes gleaming. Harry had once before had the experience of seeing something that Ron could not, but that had been a reflection in a mirror, something much more insubstantial than a hundred very solid-looking beasts strong enough to pull a fleet of carriages. If Luna was to be believed, the beasts had always been there but invisible. Why, then, could Harry suddenly see them, and why could Ron not? Are you coming or what? said Ron beside him. Oh, yeah, said Harry quickly, and they joined the crowd hurrying up the stone steps into the castle. The entrance hall was ablaze with torches and echoing with footsteps as the students crossed the flagged stone floor for the double doors to the right, leading to the great hall and the start of term feast. The four Long house tables in the great hall were filling up under the starless black ceiling, which was just like the sky they could glimpse through the high windows. Candles floated in midair all along the tables, illuminating the silvery ghosts who were dotted about the hall, and the faces of the students talking eagerly to one another, exchanging summer news, shouting greetings at friends from other houses, eyeing one another's new haircuts and robes. Again, Harry noticed people putting their heads together to whisper as he passed. He gritted his teeth and tried to act as though he neither noticed nor cared. Luna drifted away from them at the Ravenclaw table. The moment they reached Gryffindors, Ginny was hailed by some fellow fourth years and left to sit with them. Harry, Ron, Hermione, and Neville found seats together about halfway down the table, between nearly headless Nick, the Gryffindor ghost, and Parvati Patil and Lavender Brown, the last of whom gave Harry airy, overly friendly greetings that made him quite sure they had stopped talking about him a split second before. He had more important things to worry about, however, he was looking over the students' heads to the staff table that ran along the top wall of the hall. He's not there. Ron and Hermione scanned the staff table, too, though there was no real need. Hagrid's size made him instantly obvious in any lineup. He can't have left, said Ron, sounding slightly anxious. Of course he hasn't, said Harry firmly. You don't think he's... "'Heard of anything, do you?' said Hermione uneasily. "'No,' said Harry at once. "'But where is he, then?' There was a pause. Then Harry said very quietly so that Neville, Parvati, and Lavender could not hear. "'Maybe he's not back yet. "'You know, from his mission, "'the thing he was doing over the summer for Dumbledore.' "'Yeah, yeah, that'll be it,' said Ron, sounding reassured. But Hermione bit her lip, looking up and down the staff table as though hoping for some conclusive explanation of Hagrid's absence. Who's that? she said sharply, pointing toward the middle of the staff table. Harry's eyes followed hers. They lit first upon Professor Dumbledore, sitting in his high-backed golden chair at the center of the long staff table, wearing deep purple robes scattered with silvery stars and a matching hat. Dumbledore's head was inclined toward the woman sitting next to him who was talking into his ear. 